Local service ads. They, those are the biggest thing hitting real estate. They are not new for Google, but they are new for this industry. And it's we've seen a, a good boost for seller intent leads yeah. using those. What's going on, Marketing Stream viewers? My name is Jason Pantana, and we are re-kicking, re-spinning this Marketing Stream show where it used to be a live Q&A, but I'm gonna redo it. And this time I'm asking the questions and I'm talking with industry experts, uh, subject matter experts in various marketing-related roles. We'll talk about uh, email marketing with some experts, PPC marketing, online ads using Facebook, brand building, just different specific niches and subjects in the marketing space with different experts. And today we're talking Google Ads. I am with PPC experts founder and CEO of Greenlight Technology Solutions, Josh Frankel. Now, Josh is a wizard when it comes to PPC ad campaigns, specifically for real estate agents. His company runs online Google ads, Bing ads, things of that effect for real estate agents. They focus on generating leads. Uh, he's been doing it for a long time with a lot of different companies and now with his own. And then most recently, he just joined forces with Ylopo as a lead architect running PPC campaigns for Ylopo. So today we're gonna dive into, we're gonna talk about keyword planning. We're gonna talk about all the different ad products that Google offers, like display network ads, uh, like Google search ads, like YouTube ads, in-stream ads, all those different things. We're gonna give a pretty high level, broad brushstroke of what they are. We'll talk about the personalized ad changes that occurred because of all the fair housing stuff affecting Google now. And we're gonna talk about conversion tracking, hooking it up to your website so we can really get the best results in your ad campaign. So without further ado, let's jump into this interview with Josh Frankel. Josh, thanks so much for coming on the show, man. I'm super pumped to have this conversation going really in depth about pay-per-click, Google ads, just advertising online from the standpoint of being a practitioner and expert. So thanks, man, for coming on. I'm really happy to get to talk to you today. And thanks for having me. I'm, I'm excited to just explain more about PBC and, and let you and some of these agents know a little more detail about how it works. Awesome, man. All right, well, I got a bunch of questions for you. And uh, first one out of the gate, like let's just keep it simple. For the viewers watching right now, could you share just kind of a quick outline, specifically looking at Google, what are their different ad products, uh, different types of Google ads? And from your vantage point, what's the best or intended use of each of those different products, just as a starting point today? Sure, well, there's a ton. Uh, Google search is the main campaign that would be targeting a specific phrase that somebody actually types into their search engine. Uh, they'd see you know, like a text ad go through to your website. Um, I think the best use of that is for a lot of things for real estate, you could do buyer leads, seller leads, uh, branded leads for you know, typing in your actual name onto Google and making sure you're on the top of the page. There's also Google display that is usually an image ad combined with text. Sometimes it can be an interactive ad that you know, kind of looks like a video. Mm -hmm. uh, those ads would appear on Google partner sites, uh, other websites, you know, when you're scrolling on whatever ESPN and you, you see a little article on the side or a picture on the side for an advertisement, that would be a Google display ad. There's also shopping campaigns. You know, I'm sure a lot of people see those when you type in, you know, any product, you see a, a listing with a, a price. Those are for direct to consumer products, not so applicable in real estate. Right. There are also YouTube ads, a video that appears either before or during um, a YouTube video. I think those in real estate specifically are great for branding and awareness. Um, a lot of, you know, I'm not sure how many people actually watch uh, a super informational ad, but once you've actually uh, gotten them if for a retargeting purpose, if they've clicked on your website, yeah. uh, having a branding ad on YouTube to let them know a little more about you is usually a pretty good idea. This isn't a, an ad product, but I think it's something a lot of agents should have is a Google My Business. Mm. Uh, when you type in a business name onto Google search, you'll see this for almost any industry. Uh, it's got an address, a picture of the business, or a picture of the person who yeah. owns the business along with a call number. That is super important to have. And having a Google My Business links to another Google product, which is called Local Service Ads. These are brand new to real estate. They're awesome. What that does is it, it takes the picture uh, from your Google My Business along with your reviews and phone number and puts it in an advertisement at the top of Google. Those are for more seller intent ads rather than buyer. And again, those are brand new. So excited about what those will bring to the world of real estate. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then the last thing is remarketing. For all of the campaigns I just described, you could do a remarketing campaign. So for someone that engaged with your ad, went to your website, but for whatever reason wasn't ready to convert yet, we could remarket to them uh, in another way. 
for most agents or anyone doing PPC, we would install a piece of code on your website. That code would track people uh, for people that, again, clicked through, didn't sign up, weren't ready to convert. You could then re-advertise to them in a bunch of different areas on Google Display, with YouTube ads, whatever you choose. Nice. So just re what I heard in terms of the different Google ad products, there's Google search, which is the bread and butter of Google ads. I go to Google, I say homes for sale in Nashville where I live, and then bam, I see ads at the top of the results page. You talked about the Google Display Network ads, which are banner ads with text, and sometimes they turn them into lightweight motion videos where there's text and images that scale in and scale out and move and all that kind of stuff, but they're just ads. The banner ads, when I'm surfing the web, I see them all over the place, and those are Google Display Network ads, typically. Uh, yes. Third product mentioned was shopping, which is more e-commerce, direct or consumer. So if I'm shopping for furniture or something like that, I'll usually see ads or things along the top where it's specifically for shopping. Um, doesn't really apply to this audience that we're talking to for the most part. And the last one you said was YouTube ads, which um, I can't remember if you went into the detail. Are there, is there more than any, is it just the in-stream ads, the ones that play and you can skip the ad or are there other types of ads too? There are a few different types of ads. You can do a five second non-skippable video that would appear either before or during a YouTube video, depending on the length of the video. You can also do a 15 second skippable ad where after the first five seconds, someone would be allowed to skip. Yep. Um, for the most part, I, I would try to stick to a five second video. Anything that people can skip, they might, and they're not gonna get the information. Yeah, and so they have the- uh, purposes. They have the six second bumper too, which is a non-skippable, and you can do it for six seconds, right? Which is kind of like I see Liberty Mutual and different insurance companies running those ads on me all the time. What about, uh, I don't know if this is where you focus your expertise, what about video discovery ads? Do you do much with those on YouTube? Uh, not too much with discovery. Uh, I don't find it super applicable to real estate. Okay, cool. And then I also, when I'm inside the Google ads portal, which for anybody watching, it's ads.google.com. I sometimes when I'm choosing the ad product, I see that top shelf where it's like search, display, shopping, video, which is YouTube. But then I see sub variations like smart, uh, local, uh, discovery, and I see all those different ones down there. Can you talk about what those things are just for just for the sake of knowing what they are? Sure. Well, smart campaigns are auto-generated campaigns, and the other things underneath those, like local, and those are tend to be auto-generated or interact with smart campaigns. So a smart campaign would be, for someone in real estate, Google would actually create ads for you. They would choose keywords to target. They would write ad text. This is applicable to any of their campaigns. You can do a smart search campaign, a smart huh. display campaign, uh, a smart shopping campaign. Um, personally, I don't tend to be a fan of a lot of the stuff Google pulls in with that automation, but they are available for people that aren't necessarily experts in advertising, but might want to get something started. Got it, got it. All right, so talk to us about what are some obvious campaigns that you would say like, hey, every real estate professional should be running these things. Uh, just different types of camp, whether they're search, display, YouTube, whatever, just obvious campaigns in your book that you think agents should work to get in place. Sure, the first thing is not necessarily a campaign, but it's that Google My Business. Make sure you've got your photo, your reviews, phone number, everything on Google. Just having that online presence uh, is a definite boost and you'll get people who search for your name or your business that'll call you without ads. Yeah. For yeah. the advertising portion, I would say search is really the bread and butter. I would always recommend in almost every market buyer leads. You can usually find them at a pretty cost effective rates and a buyer a lot of times is going to be a seller eventually. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of double dip there uh, in terms of your ROI. I, so I, I would definitely agree. recommend the standard buyer campaigns, you know, like homes for sale in Nashville and a, a ton, you know, thousands of more variations of keywords, but that okay. would be for most agents what I would recommend. So with, so search campaigns, homes for sale in Nashville or around Nashville or those types of search terms. Um, I totally, I totally dig that. And I think it's great feedback to also have that Google My Business because you want to have that there with your ads and so forth. Talk to us for a second, if you could then, about keywords. Since you're talking about Google search ads, give us, give us sort of an overview of the keyword planner um, from the point of view of an agent. What do I need to know about choosing keywords in my market area? It depends based on your market, you know, what people are searching for, what buyers look for in a home. Uh, but for the most part, you want to look for really long tail specific phrases. The key is 
you know, not always, but for the most part, to avoid the shorter phrases that might be either unclear or just general in their meaning. Yeah. Um, for I'll use the example of the word balloon. You know, you, you don't just want to search for house or balloon. You want to search for red balloon or big red balloon. Adding any descriptor or qualifier on there will often, you know, increase the intent. I would also say that for keywords, uh, you don't want to use anything that's got a double meaning. So for real estate, for example, home prices near me, someone searching for home prices, are we really sure whether that person is a buyer or a seller? No. When, you know, when we're spending money on advertising, a keyword like that could bring in some good leads, but it would almost definitely bring in junk alongside it. Yeah. So you want to make sure that every keyword you choose is clear and specific in terms of its intent. So I could see where, just for instance, I could choose the keywords, um, homes for sale in Nashville, where I live. And that qualifier of in Nashville would should theoretically increase intent, I would imagine, on a search like that. Or I could just target keywords, homes for sale, and then I could build an audience whereby I'm only running that ad in and around Nashville. I'm gonna assume the former where I put in Nashville as part of the keywords is probably a better play as far as gather, getting intent. What, do you, what would you say to that? I would say yes, and it would also help you to find buyers that weren't necessarily in your area. You, know, you could do a homes yeah. for sale general keyword and target just people around the Nashville area, but that's not applicable to every market. You know, Florida, for example, is a state where there are a ton of second homeowners, people that own vacation homes that spend part of the year there. You want those advertisements to be appearing for people all over the United States or cold weather, high income states where people are likely to buy. So from that perspective, you know, targeting a homes for sale in Nashville keyword, we might want that keyword to appear for people in North Carolina, South Carolina, oh, yeah. Kentucky, nearby places that someone might move from. Absolutely. And I think it is going to be interesting. This is a sidebar. But with census data coming out this year, they always report on inbound and outbound migration, where are people moving to and where are they moving from? And so you can typically look for some hot feeder markets. It's usually called the census flow mapper here in the US, uh, the census flow mapper. And it's it hasn't been updated in four years, but we're due for it this year. So that's gonna be, I think, some extra intel. And I wanna go back to what you said a second ago about you focus on getting buyer leads, because I've said that for a long time, because we know that roughly two thirds of buyers are sellers. Um, I often would say, what's the first thing somebody who's thinking about selling their home might do that would indicate they're thinking about selling their home? And most people say, oh, they might get a home valuation or, or they might clean out their house. And I'm like, well, they might clean out their house. But I would argue the first thing they're likely to do is search for the home they're probably going to move into because they're going to want to have some, there's going to be some impetus behind why they're selling and it's probably they want to move someplace else. So to me, that's just a strong reinforcement and a reminder that all the money is made in the follow-up. And you really better have some great campaigns ready to roll as soon as you generate these leads of, hey, once I get these leads, what am I going to do with them to make sure that they are um, being properly worked, that we're basically flushing out anybody who is interested in selling and we have the right campaigns for them? Would you add anything else to that? I don't know that I'd have too much to add. That's been my general philosophy as well. You, know, you can find home valuation leads or seller leads. They tend to be a little more on the expensive side. Um, with the cost effectiveness of buyer leads and those guys often uh, becoming sellers, uh, yeah. that's where we definitely like to focus. And you know, the, the follow-up is a really key portion of PPC um, and lead generation in general. I would say it's part three of a three-part process. You know, part yeah. one is your website. Yeah. Part two is actually having the advertising to get qualified people to that site. Part three would be the follow-up, call, text, email, whatever you, you decide. Whatever you have the consent to do, right? Um, sure. And I know we're in a market right now where inventory is extremely sparse and people are looking for listings, listings, listings. And there are some lead sources that are, I don't want to go off the rails here in our conversation. There are some lead sources that are, you know, expired listings, things like that, where they tend to be focused on sellers, obviously. But I don't know, in my head, I'm like, just give me as many buyer leads as I can possibly manage and put together some great email, text campaigns, whatever it is, and start trying to find the folks who are like, well, we're looking, we'd love to we'd love to buy, but we gotta sell first. Oh, really, you do? And then there's a whole conversation to be had from that, going, that point going forward. If I could add something to yeah. this, and I don't think this is a big secret from a marketing's perspective, but the way Google works is pay-per-click. You're paying every time somebody clicks on the ad. Uh, for the seller terms, they're just much more expensive. It's much more competitive. You'll be paying several dollars every time somebody clicks on your ad in most markets. 
it's not the case uh, for, from a buyer perspective. So you might be able to get four or five buyer leads even for the same cost as you're getting a seller lead, which, um, you know. And we just said two thirds are sellers, so probably. Right. <laughs> right, it, the math it'll works add, out. It'll add up. Yeah. Um, all right, so let's keep talking about keywords for a second because my goal with these interviews is to go as deep as we can to really push the envelope on the subject. And you're, you're an expert with PPC and with Google and whatnot. Going back to keywords, can you just briefly help folks understand who are maybe running their own ad campaigns and they don't have somebody doing it for them or they want to understand better how these ad campaigns work? Um, what's the difference between broad match, modified broad match, phrase match, and exact match keywords? Just so we can really understand how do keywords and queries work in terms of placing ads on Google? Sure. Um, I'll start with the broad first. Yeah. The, the broad match will not just bring in what you uh, choose as the keyword, but it'll also bring in outside and complementary services. So I'll use the same phrase balloon as the example. If you type balloon into Google and use a broad match keyword, you could bring in red balloon, you could bring in balloon animals, you could bring in hot air balloon. Helium, anything, whatever. Right, anything related to the, a, a balloon. You know, for a dog, it'd be dog walkers, dog parks you know, dogs for sale. So if I said, for instance, home, just home, I could bring in furniture, staging, sales, all of it, right? Home renovations. Yeah. Anything that's with the word home or, or involves that subject. Okay. Broad match modifier uh, would, would take a specific phrase. So let's use blue balloon. If I chose to target blue balloon with a broad match modifier, what I'm telling Google is I want those two words to appear in the search but they don't necessarily have to appear in that order. So for example, blue balloon as a broad match modified, that would come up with big blue balloon, it would come up for blue and red balloon. As long as those words are in the phrase, but or in the keyword rather, but yeah. even if they're not in the exact order we specify, broad match modified will pull those up. Is there any There's kind of, I'm sorry, I was gonna ask, is there any kind of special, um, I, I had rather you have to put a plus word, uh, the symbol of a plus before the words to do that. How does that connect? Yes, when you're inputting them into Google, having a broad keywords have no modifier. It's just the word as it's written or the phrase as it's written. For the broad match modifier, you just add a plus before every single word. It's not necessary for some words like in and for, you know, some very prepositions. Small yeah. Right. But for the most part, you just put a plus before the word and that will add the broad match modifier. All right. All right. So cool. There's a little bit of overlap between phrase and broad match modifier. So what phrase keywords are is it's like broad match modifier, except what we're telling Google is those words have to appear in the order that we specify. Mm. So blue balloon for broad match modified would come up with blue and red balloon. But for a phrase, if we chose to do blue balloon for a phrase match, it would only come up for big blue balloon or giant blue balloon. You know, it has to be in that order exactly. In the order. There's nothing in between. It couldn't be balloon blue. It has to be in that exact order. But a modified broad match could be balloon blue, blue and red balloon, any order, as long as those two words appear in the search query, right? All right. And then exact match is exact. It is exactly what you type in and only that phrase. So if I choose the word balloon as an exact match, my ad will only show up when they search the word balloon. No other words attached to it, uh, nothing around it. Same with blue balloon. It's just the exact phrase typed in exactly as you've targeted it and only that phrase. So that would even mean if I said balloon versus balloons, plural, that little S could modify, could make it so that it doesn't place if I did the verbatim exact match. Um, and just for the sake of our viewers learning, uh, we said a plus symbol goes before every word of a modified broad match. A broad match when you're inputting into Google is just the words themselves. And then a phrase match, how do you mark that? And then an uh, exact match, how do you mark it? So a phrase match would be marked with quotations. You would put a quote at the beginning and end of the phrase. For exact match, it would be marked by brackets. So a okay. bracket at the beginning and a bracket at the end. Cool. And one thing about plurals for exact as well. So Google does actually have some targeting for plurals. Okay. So home for sale and homes for sale, Google will read that as the same word for the most part. There are some inconsistencies. Personally, from a best practice standpoint, I like to target all singulars and plurals just to make sure we're fully covered but Google does have some algorithms to be able to track those. All right, so it, 
when you're running, this is a total, this isn't one of our planned questions, but it seems like, boy, if you're gonna run a search campaign on Google, you gotta put a lot of thought and analysis into what are the keywords I'm targeting here. Is there any kind of science or formula to how many keywords and how long do I typically run these ads for? Not really. I would say in terms of how many keywords, it's more about the intent than okay. the amount. Um, obviously for, you know, for certain areas, you wanna make sure you're fully covered. Um, but the intent is always going to be more important than just the sheer number of keywords. Yeah. Search volume is another big one. I would say, you know, for really specific phrases in real estate, like two bedroom home with pool, that is going to be a very specific phrase, but not a lot of people might search it. Mm. So even though we know that it's high intent, there aren't going to be that many people actually typing in that phrase. So yeah. you always want to make sure that the keywords you're typing in have enough volume on their own rather than just, you know, the sheer amount of keywords that are in there. And then what about duration of these campaigns? Is there any kind of a uh, thinking behind how long should I run these for? I'm just curious your thoughts. Sure. It's more about sample size. So what I'm looking for is either a click sample or a spend sample. So for the most part, I'm really not going to make too many decisions under a hundred bucks or a few hundred clicks on a campaign, for example. Um, you know, if we can expect an ad to convert at 7%, for example, you know, 100 clicks, 200 clicks, that'll bring in 7 to 14 leads. That's a pretty small sample size. It can let us start to know where things are working and where things aren't. But yeah. generally, the larger the sample size, the better things are. And I'm I was going to say, ahead. I'm assuming Google gives you some analysis on that on the front end before you press submit to your ad. Uh, actually, no. Uh, Google doesn't really give you too much information mm. on how much they think it'll spend until you actually start spending that's where you would depend on, you know, historical data, stuff that you've already built up in research. How do you how do you get your sample sizes then? Is what I'm trying to figure out. In terms of uh, just what, determining how long I'm going to run an ad campaign for. You were talking about wanting to make sure there's a certain volume of searches or a certain expected number of clicks, or is it that you're monitoring it as it's going and then you can turn it on, turn it off, spend more based upon its performance? Well, it's both. So. When we're launching something in Google, we're gonna there's gonna be a lot of different keywords and yeah. a lot of different groupings of those keywords. So for example, we might have a thousand keywords targeting the area of Nashville. Mm. What I want to see is for each of those individual keywords to build up enough on their own. Yeah. Um, that'll let us know. So it's kind of a monitor as you go okay. uh, type deal where you're looking for what's working and what isn't and cutting out the stuff that isn't working to focus on the most efficient stuff. Uh, in general, though, for sample size, I, I'd like to work with at least a few hundred. Um, it's maybe arbitrary, but just from what I've seen over managing these real estate campaigns, um, once you get to kind of a month-ish of data, uh, a, a few hundred dollars to spend, um, that's really enough to start to optimize the campaigns and start to really find out what's working in what areas. And then you make the adjustments and then relaunch it and then have a pretty steady, predictable flow of, I'm gonna get this many clicks, this many people who come to the website are gonna fill out the web form, generate this many leads, and then you get your cost per lead, and then they go into the follow-up, which is the next thing, right? To work the leads intelligently. Um, that's, I mean, this is all super helpful, and this is pretty, I, I would argue, pretty deep for this audience in terms of understanding how this goes, but I gotta tell you, like, I don't talk a lot about running Google search ads because of this conversation which is just the level of complexity in terms of planning keywords, choosing keywords, optimizing campaigns. It's a whole lot easier just to go push a boost button on Facebook or even use the Facebook ads manager. Um, frankly, I think YouTube in-stream ads aren't that complicated, nor are Google uh, Display Network ads, but man, these search ads, this is a little bit more science involved from my estimation. And I, I hopefully this was useful for the viewers who are watching it to get a sense for it. Let me switch gears for a second. Um, we know in 2020, Google updated their personalized ads policies. Specifically, it's had an impact on housing. They're trying to more closely adhere to discrimination um, laws like fair housing and so forth. What can you tell us about what's happened with Google advertising from a personalized ad standpoint? What do we need to know in the real estate space right now? With the right keywords, it shouldn't affect you too much. So, you know, like you said, Google uh, is trying to become fair housing compliant. Yeah. Uh, they were previously allowing real estate agents to exclude based on a number of demographics, yeah. age, gender, household income, that type of stuff. Uh, also, zip code targeting by location. Yep. So, and, and I'll back up and say there are two types of targeting within Google. 
there's the keywords we choose. So we always know if you don't type in a keyword that we choose to target, you're not going to show up for our ads. Right. So that's one method. The second method is through locations and demographics. So we can choose where your ads appear. You know, we can choose a mile radius around a certain location. We can open up your advertising to certain states or the yeah. whole United States. And we used to be able to you know, filter down by age and gender and things like that. The second form of targeting is what the Fair Housing Act uh, targets. You can't really do a, a bunch of stuff by zip code. So I can't post a Nashville ad only in a specific zip code. Uh, the second thing is we can't exclude based on any protected class, which is age, income, gender, race, stuff like that. With the right keywords, though, if you're targeting the right intent, it shouldn't matter that we aren't able to look at those things demographic wise. For example, someone searching for active adult communities or 55 plus communities, we know those people are going to be in a certain age range. The one thing that I would say it might have a slight effect on is income. Being able to exclude some lower income buyers might help in certain markets, especially California, where you know, the homes are, you're looking at million dollar homes that might be $300,000 in North Carolina, right. where I live. Um, but for the most part, uh, with the right keyword targeting, if you're choosing specific long tail keywords, if you're making sure that the intent is there, the the uh, exclusions from the targeting from the Fair Housing Act should not have too much effect on buyer campaigns. So where where I think we're going to see agents having the most like scratch in their head moments is with their Google Display Network ads, even their YouTube ads, uh, things along those, because there's a lot more audience targeting that typically occurs inside of those sorts of ads than say Google search ads. What sort of uh, tips or advice or general commentary would you give to them when it comes to display network ads? And obviously we should never be targeting on the basis of discrimination ever. You're not allowed to do that, whether or not a system was making it possible. But when it comes to targeting specific geographies, like for example, Google display network ads, we, we typically see agents using those more as branding in their local marketplace. And so geography seems to matter a lot more. Uh, YouTube, it can also be the same kind of a thing, using it as branding. And, and I would go back to an earlier comment you made where you see YouTube as a really powerful branding tool. I agree. Um, but with branding, there's typically a geographic overlay or some type of audience targeting. Um, do you see that having sort of any clashes with these new personalized ads rules? No. You just can't type in an individual zip code, but if you want to type in, for example, a 50-mile radius around the city that encompasses those zip codes, that's perfectly fine. What's the minimum uh, radius? Do you know? I believe it is 25 miles. Is it 25? Okay. But I'm, I think you can, you can even go lower in certain instances. I know it, we've gone as low as 10-mile radiuses. I think I've seen three get approved. Before. Yeah, I don't want to. So I don't want to be quoted on that, but that, that seems yeah, to well, be varied. And I guess, well, let me say, twenty-five miles is the lowest that I would personally use for some of these, but we have definitely seen them go lower. Yeah. Well, with Facebook, it's you know their special ad categories. It was a straight nope. You can't go below fifteen miles, and it was just a clean break. Google seems to be more of a it depends answer because yes. I've we've targeted cities where we just type in the whole city name, and it's smaller than that area. Sometimes a city can be the size of a zip code, but that seems to be fine. Um, right, and it, it's a weird, um, it seems to be, a, I guess, a, a weird exclusion to make that you can't type in an individual zip code, but you can still they're, they're from cities. And, they're, you know, they appear to be trying to protect against redlining because it was on the basis of excluding certain areas. Um, so there is, there is some thinking tied to it in terms of things that have happened in the past. Um, but I, I get where the, it's challenging because when you sell houses in a specific area, you sell houses in a specific area and that's just the right. way that it is. Um, okay. Anything else you would say about the whole personalized ads and impacts to watch out for? Because the other thing I would say is with Facebook inside their ads manager, they basically grade out the areas that you can't touch anymore. So it's very clear what you can and can't do, but inside the Google ads portal, it's not. Uh, it's, you can still do all the same things. It just doesn't approve your ad. It rejects it. Any, any advice around that? Uh, I would just avoid any demographic uh, targeting entirely for those reasons. Uh, Facebook, the reason specifically, too, that Facebook has grayed out some of those areas is I believe that they weren't actually getting that info from Facebook. Mm. You know, they were getting that information from third parties and connecting it to Facebook accounts. 
The information that Google collects about your age, gender, demographic, income, for the most part, comes from Google or Google partners. Interesting. All right, that's good to know. Uh, let's let's keep moving along. I got a few more things I want to get through, and I'm I know we're taking. This is a great conversation. I appreciate your time. Can yeah, you talk absolutely. to us about um, just conversion goals? I know this is a question I get with clients a lot when they're ter- choosing bidding. Let's pretend it's a display network ad campaign or any kind of an ad campaign. And it's it has their automatic bidding recommendations, whatever, whatever, whatever it is they think you want. And then it talks about conversions and s- establishing conversion goals. Can you kind of help us understand what that is so we understand how to navigate it? Sure. Well, as for the specific process of setting it up, that's different based on each client's website and setup. But in general, conversion goals are how we would measure ad performance. So if you don't have a conversion goal set up and we are running uh, lead traffic to your website, we might have a general idea of what you're spending, how much it's generating. Mm-hmm. What those conversion goals do from an advertising perspective you can see so much data within the actual account with those conversion goals. You can see uh, exactly where somebody searched. You can see the exact keyword or phrase they typed in when they signed up. You can see the time of day they signed up, the day of week. Um, it's a ton of different, you know, even whether they signed up on a mobile phone versus a laptop computer. That data is what helps you really optimize the campaign. Okay. Uh, so without those conversion goals, an advertiser would be for the most part, you know, fly and blind in terms of uh, whether that something is really working or, or whether something isn't. Conversion goals are, are super important for that reason. What I would recommend to every real estate agent who is looking for a website and they want to start lead generation, make sure that that website is compatible with any of these three codes, Google Tag Manager, Google Analytics, or Google Ads Conversion Code. You need to make sure that your site is compatible with that code that way, when somebody clicks on your sign-up form, actually becomes a lead or goes to the web page that we choose for someone that converts, uh, we'll be able to track that information, uh, optimize your campaigns, and, and really find out what's working for you. And I would say, too, like, from my understanding, because the conversion goal is, like, conversions can be part of your bidding. You can bid on a basis of trying to maximize conversions, which means, if I understand that properly, that Google is learning from what people do once they click your ad, go to your website, what actions they do or don't take. Because you've hooked up that snippet or that code on your website, Google actually has optics on what people are doing and it can automatically uh, be influenced in terms of who it shows your ad to to try to get that result to occur more and more, which means your cost per result on your campaign is being driven down by having smart conversions in place or smart goals in place. Yes, and without that conversion tracking in place, you're limited for what you can do there on Google. So, you know, like you said, that Google does have algorithms where you can focus on maximizing your conversions. So generally, even we advertisers will work to optimize and reduce the waste, but Google's algorithms and their learning is also very important in this process. Um, it will start if you have the right tracking in, in place to automate your bids uh, mm. maybe bid a little higher for certain things if they think someone's going to convert. Um, that stuff really matters. Well. Now, there are things we can do without conversion tracking. There, there is a bid strategy called maximize clicks yeah. where we would ask Google to do nothing but get you the most possible people clicking on your ad at the lowest cost. But I don't always find that to be the most effective strategy, uh, having that conversion tracking and letting Google's algorithms work alongside your work is really the way to go. Yeah, and I've seen people do viewable impressions as a goal with display network ads in particular, which is fine if you just want massive exposure and you don't care what they do with it, as long as they just see you everywhere. But I agree, this is like for me personally, I actually, I have Google Analytics on my website um, and I set up conversion goals inside of Google Analytics and I've got it linked to my Google Ads and so it pulls the conversion goals from analytics, and you made a, a great point, I hope people were listening, about Tag Manager, uh, the Google Ads code itself, their conversion code, or, that's a big word, or Google Analytics, because all three of those things can talk to each other and get linked up, which is nice. Yes. And it's cool. Google Tag Manager is one that can actually be an all-encompassing code. You yeah. could include Google Analytics and Google Ads conversion on there. Um, for real estate purposes, I would definitely make sure you've got either analytics or the ads conversion code, having those goals will, will really, really help. Tag manager is a good plus to have it be all encompassing. Okay. Love it. Um, let's, let's jump ahead. I want to go to the last question. 
um, in your mind, what in your eyes, what's new or changing in Google's advertising space? What are you looking at? And what should we also be paying attention to and making adjustments around? Local service ads. They, those are the biggest thing hitting real estate. They are not new for Google, but they are new for this industry. And it's we've seen a, a good boost for seller intent leads yeah. using those. It's why I stress for every agent to have a Google My Business uh, getting access to those local service ads is a, a huge plus. The ability for someone to click to call you, it's definitely a better intent. It's, you can work with home value leads for sellers, and I've seen those leads be extremely profitable. I think we know how to generate them at a decent cost. Not quite at the same rate as buyers, of course. But at the end of the day, someone picking up the phone and calling you, when they really want to talk to you or they have questions about a property is going to be a better lead than someone signing up on a lead form. Yeah. They are more expensive as well, but it, LSAs, local service ads, that's the big thing in real estate. Uh, that's a big thing for, for Google moving forward. And I'm really interested to see how it affects the advertising landscape. I, I am too. Um, let's just talk about that for a quick second. So a couple of things, um, I, certainly you can Google search what local services ads are. Like you said, they've been around for a while. They, I think they rolled out last year for real estate agents they, and they connect to your Google, my business profile, sort of connect to it has been my experience. Um, sometimes they ask you for new headshots. Sometimes they pull your reviews over. Sometimes they don't seems to be what I'm seeing so far, but can you go a little bit deeper? Um, I think there are probably people who are watching this who are like, Hey, it's a really invasive process to get these things set up. I'm doing a background check with, um, a third party. They're asking for my social security number. What can you tell us about all that stuff? That stuff is, you know, like it with anything else, Google just wants to make sure if they're sending people through to your phone number, to your website, anything with you, they just want to make sure that's totally verified. I know it seems like a ton of information to give, especially in advertising. And it's a, a lot extra info compared to what you're giving for a search campaign or a display campaign. But at the same time, because you're also asking those leads to take the extra step. The, uh, you know, with that link to Google My Business, the local service ads are also showing you know, your reviews. Yeah. The reputation you have as an agent is really important for Google to make sure that everyone that's clicking and calling you Satisfied. really gets, right, they, they get a top-notch service, which is what they want. Um, and you know, the, the more you pick up your phone and the better service you give those leads, the more Google will like that and they'll keep your ads at the top. And I hear they're tracking whether or not you're picking up the phone calls. I believe so. Response rate is a big deal for local service ads. And I also hear that the impressions are free and you're only paying for the leads. Is that true? Or the connections, t technically speaking? I think you are not paying for illegitimate calls. So, um, you know, like a bounce call or, or someone that- Well, and I've heard, about, I've heard about agent sabotage where agents are calling other agents to try to, <laughs> I've heard about sabotage, but those seem to be being disputed and discarded right now. Uh, but you're not yeah, paying for the impressions. Is You're paying for results. You said, uh, my experience with them has been, you set your weekly bid budget, but you're only paying when Google delivers connections. In fact, they, I think they put it in writing on their website that that's the case. And that's why the ads are such a big deal. You know, they're, it's almost a guarantee of intent as much as you can get with an online lead where you've got potentially some realtors doing the, the sabotage stuff. Well, but to me, the biggest, the biggest thing is typically what are typical Google search ads homes for sale in Nashville. So the intent is I'm looking for a house with or without an agent, theoretically. And so the agent tries to swoop in there to be the buffer between the house and that person. With these Google local services ads, the search phrases are generally best real estate agent in Nashville, top agent in Nashville. And so literally the intent of the search that triggers the ad is actually looking for the agent. To me, I, I've never seen that anywhere that I can think of apart from referrals and things like that. Well, you could certainly target those keywords in regular PPC, you know, best real estate agent in Nashville, sure. but it's going to be an expensive term. Because you're going to be up against better. HomeLite and UpNest and all those big players. This seems to be an extra cutting the line, if you will, opportunity for agents right now. Yes. And I know you did mention the intent around those. This is really a, a seller type intent at this point. There's no almost buyer targeting at all. So your homes for sale keywords, that type of stuff. Uh, those folks will not be seeing local service ads. But really? Hmm. It's, it's definitely a seller intent. Local service is in the name, so seller intent and close by to the agent. That's, I mean, I will tell you, I've heard a couple of stories of somebody calls an agent, hey, we're on our way to meet with a builder. We just thought we might want to have representation. Can you meet us over there to help us write the contract out? I've heard of those like on the fly sort of 
not often kind of occurrences, but I think it's interesting that you bring up the seller focus. I hope everybody's listening really closely right now on the intent of those phrases. Um, well, yeah. listen, I've gone over the time that you and I committed to, and I, I super appreciate um, everything you said. Just tell folks where they can connect with you uh, if, if they'd like to, and then we'll be done for the day. A strange timing for this interview because my <laughs> yeah, website right? is actually down at the moment. But I've got <laughs> someone working on a, a new version of my website. So, hey, and I'll tell you what, when you get the website up, I'll update the description below. So wherever you guys are watching this, I'll update the links so you know how to access his website when that time is right. Um, so depending upon when you watch this, that'll have some kind of a variation on what's in that description. Uh, Josh, thank you so much, man. You've been a wealth of knowledge. I'm grateful for you. Thanks very much. And thanks for the time, Jason. Hopefully this info uh, helps a lot of agents out with some questions they had and uh, definitely a, a lot of detail in this Google campaign. So yeah. happy to help in any way I can. You've been a help. Thanks.